The Colorado Dream Newcomers Welcome is sponsored by Ames Community College. This podcast is serialized. If this is your first time listening, it's best to start at the beginning. Salwa Mortada Bamba moved to Aurora from the West African country of Liberia over two decades ago. America was always seen like Liberia's like stepsister, like older stepsister kind of thing. If you were a Liberian, America was the place to go. Liberia's close relationship to the U.S. dates back to the early 1800s. The country was founded by freed slaves and white Americans who were part of the American Colonization Society. The ACS included prominent politicians, slaveholders, and abolitionists, a very unusual group to come together. But they all believed free blacks and whites could never coexist equally in the U.S. Growing up in the 80s, American culture was part of Salwa's life. She watched The Cosby Show, Different Strokes, and The Muppet Show, and listened to Lionel Richie and Whitney Houston on the radio. Michael Jackson. Oh, my God. The jacket, the shoes, the watch, the T-shirts, the shades he would wear. We had everything Michael Jackson. Sawa was just 12 in 1989 when a civil war erupted in Liberia and her life was turned upside down. Amid the ongoing violence and instability in the country, Sawa couldn't see a future for herself. Her dream was to go to medical school in the U.S. What the imagination does to you, you know, you, you build up this picture in your head and, and, and the life that you're, poss- you're possibly going to live. In her late teens, and with the blessing of her parents, she decided to leave Africa to pursue the American dream, the one she'd seen on TV and heard about on the radio. That Hollywood fantasy was not what Salva found when she arrived in the U.S. It was different. And I finally realized, well, okay, so there are people just like me. They don't have gold for skin. The streets are not made of gold. It's, it's, it's just another place on earth. I'm Stephanie Daniel. And this is the Colorado Dream Newcomers Welcome from KUNC. Our series explores the Black immigrant experience in Colorado. It's told through the eyes of one African woman and the city of Aurora that's working to become an inclusive home for all. This is episode two, Integration. Salwa arrived at JFK International Airport in New York City in 1998. She was carrying one suitcase and a few hundred dollars. Her aunt picked her up, and on the way to her home, Salwa quickly got a taste of American life. And she took me to KFC. She goes through the drive-thru, and I was like, what? You can order your food in the car? (laughs) She ended up staying with her aunt and six cousins in Queens for months. But she didn't like New York. It was too noisy, congested, and cold. She left New York as soon as she could and moved to Aurora, Colorado, where her uncle Urias Potter had put down roots. They'd never met in person, but he welcomed her with open arms. She didn't seem scared. She seemed like someone that had a mission, you know, and uh, she seems very poised and very confident, you know, that she knew what she was here to do and what she wanted to do. Urias got her set up in her new city. He bought her new clothes and helped her get a Colorado ID and open a bank account. Back then, Aurora was a growing city, but still dwarfed by neighboring Denver. To Salwa, Aurora was just a quaint, small town full of promise. To me, it wasn't a city at that time. It was a village that was kind of like a teenager maturing into this beautiful young woman, and today she's an adult. The city of Aurora butts up against the eastern border of Denver. Like many other communities in the American West, the land was home to indigenous tribes until the 1860s, when Irish, Scandinavian, and German settlers showed up and built farms. 
Scott Williams, is the director of the Aurora History Museum. I suppose it's that age-old story of, you know, the manifest destiny. Everybody was looking for um, a way to improve themselves, find some money, um, you know, happiness, liberty, freedom, all of those things. In 1928, after the number of residents had grown to over 2,000, Aurora officially became a city. As you look into Aurora's history, the thing that's fascinating, uh, too, is that, you know, really the military drove the growth. By the early 1940s, there were two military facilities. And along with those came an influx of servicemen and women and veterans who needed post-war housing. Hoffman Heights was developed in 1952 by architect Samuel Hoffman. This is from a 2016 Channel 9 news series exploring the history of local neighborhoods. Hoffman called himself the Henry Ford of the home building industry. He used an assembly line construction method to quickly build homes in this neighborhood. The planned community included a fire station, school, library, park, and shopping center. After that, housing subdivisions sprawled out in every direction as Aurora's population boomed. Here's Scott Williams again. From the the 60s onward is when you see folks coming from all over the world, whether it be through the military or looking for economic benefits, looking for housing that was affordable uh, here in Aurora. By the mid-1980s, the city's population was close to 160,000, and Aurora Public Schools reported 39 different languages were spoken by students at home. Fast forward to 2015. The foreign-born population in Aurora had grown to over 65,000, a little more than one in six residents. Over half came from the Americas, mainly Mexico. After that, the largest groups hailed from Ethiopia, Vietnam, Korea, El Salvador, and India. That was the year the Syrian refugee crisis made national and international headlines. President Barack Obama pledged to accept 10,000 of them among a larger group of refugees from around the world. But while some governors and mayors embraced this idea, others pushed back and refused to accept them. Aurora found itself at a crossroads. The city could latch onto an anti-immigrant sentiment that was growing in the U.S. or go a full 180 and embrace these groups and weave them into the fabric of the city. Local leaders chose option number two, integration. Here's former Aurora Mayor Steve Hogan during his State of the City address in May of 2015. People from about 140 different countries make their home here because they feel welcome, they find opportunity, they achieve success, and they have comfortable places to live with excellent housing values. A month before Hogan's speech, the city had created an Office of International and Immigrant Affairs to guide a more strategic and holistic approach to immigration. Ricardo Gambetta, an immigrant from Peru, was the first person to head up the new office. Our city leaders at the time, intentionally, you know, they make a very important decision. They realize that in the last 20 years, uh, we have a new face of the city. The office conducted an assessment to figure out how to best serve the needs of newcomers, then partnered with nonprofit groups to plot a course of action. That September, local leaders unveiled a three-year plan to integrate immigrants and refugees into the city. The plan would help these residents access housing, education, health care, and city services. And it would bolster Aurora's economy. We have the new generation of workers in the city. We have the new generation of potential new small business in the city. Research shows that immigrants and refugees are more likely to be entrepreneurs than those born in the United States. So in a move that's clearly a win-win, the city provides information to help foreign-born residents get their licenses and register their businesses. There's also a fund that provides loans for startup or expansion costs. Meanwhile, the city benefits from the new businesses through increased tax revenue. And just in the, in the last few years, I understand that we were able to open at least more than 40 new small businesses across the city. 
Aurora was the first city in Colorado to create an integration plan, and Ricardo Gambetta, the manager of International and Immigrant Affairs, was concerned about how residents would react to more of their neighbors speaking a foreign language or having different customs. You don't know anything about them, so your first reaction is to be a little concerned, be afraid. But then people from different cultures get to know each other. And he says that's what's been happening in many of Aurora's neighborhoods. Families attend the same church or run into each other at the grocery store. Their children play together. And you get the, the opportunity to know about the others. I mean, those first disappear. So I, I think most of the local residents understood that it was the right thing to do at the time. To educate residents about the plan, the office held workshops and conversations, co-sponsored and promoted soccer tournaments and ethnic festivals, including one of the city's largest cultural celebrations, the annual Global Fest. We dance together with and try international food, and we have performers, we have the Peru nations. I'm in Coming up, we'll hear how a local congregation pivoted to become a one-stop shop to help immigrant communities. We are really a place where people feel that they can come and be seen and they have a place of belonging. You're listening to The Colorado Dream. The Colorado Dream, Newcomers Welcome, is supported by Ames Community College. Positioning learners to meet current and future workforce needs in northern Colorado for more than 50 years. Info at ames.edu. The Colorado Sun is an award-winning news outlet founded by some of the state's top journalists. We bring our readers and listeners the most important stories in politics, education, the outdoors, and so much more. Listen to our podcast, The Daily Sun Up, as our reporters go beyond the headlines to explore what makes Colorado tick. Whether it's the latest on the water crisis, conversations with leaders like Governor Jared Polis, or stories of activists, ranchers, or business owners, we shine a light on what matters most. Tune in on coloradosun.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. At the same time that the city of Aurora was pivoting to support immigrants, St. Matthew Lutheran Church in North Aurora was also at a crossroads. The average age of the congregation was around 80, and membership had dwindled significantly. Pastor Marcel Naruki and his stepdaughter Amanda Blarock presented a proposal to members to see whether or not they'd be interested in donating the church to a nonprofit that we had yet to create in order to turn the church inside out to actually invite the neighbors in in a different way. The congregation voted unanimously to donate the building and land to the yet-to-be-created nonprofit. Less than a year later, they founded the Village Exchange Center, or VEC. We did 11 language focus groups with different communities where we had a translator and just ask questions like, what is it that you want? What would it look like for you to come in here? What are the needs that you have in this community? VEC opened its doors to immigrant and refugee communities in 2017. Congolese, Bhutanese Nepali, and other groups hold Sunday worship services at VEC. While resident partners like the Ethiopian Community of Colorado rent office space, the community center also has a robust food pantry. This is the pantry, basically. So we just finished unloading the truck, and they're organizing, like, separating the foods. Bim Batrai is showing me the food pantry where he works as an assistant. He picks up donations from the food bank of the Rockies, then brings them here, where volunteers sort the items and place them into bags. They also add more culturally familiar foods bought from local ethnic grocers. And then we make the, create the bags, like 400, up to 600 bags. And the family, we have curbside tomorrow. Bim was born in Bhutan, but went to live in a refugee camp in Nepal as a young child. He stayed in the camp for over two decades and got married before being resettled in Aurora in 2014, where he had family living. 
When he arrived, the language barrier was the hardest thing for him. But there were other challenges, too. Everything is new. Even though I cannot afford to ride a bicycle, everybody here, they are driving a car, they are moving. I don't see nobody walking by a hand. So I don't know, I feel like frustrated. How can I drive, the, drive here? How can I go to the work? But over time, Bim adjusted to his new life. He took English classes, got help from several refugee resettlement organizations, and started working. He and his wife have two young kids, and they saved up enough money to buy a house in 2021. I work two jobs and really struggle, so I have a dream to make my own house, you know, and I fulfill that dream, so I'm so happy. Vec also manages one of the most successful parts of Aurora's integration plan, the Natural Helpers Program. Over three days of training, immigrant and refugee volunteers learn how to help their neighbors navigate the city's resources. Um, now we're going to present the certificates. Um, one Saturday in early spring 2022, in Vec's large main hall, the program graduated yet another cohort. First person, Veronica Saragossa. Veronica Jose Gomez manages the Natural Helpers Program. After calling each graduate's name, he hands them a silver medal. Then Aurora Miramai Kaufman gives them a certificate. Danny Miramontes. The Natural Helpers are like this bridge between their country and here, that we're going to guide them that we're going to walk with them, that we're going to empower them, equip them. Um, because I feel that one of the biggest things that has kept our immigrant or refugee community, uh, you could say, down is lack of knowledge. VEC has recruited and trained about 200 volunteers so far, and they've helped thousands of people in their communities navigate a range of resources, like finding employment and access to legal, medical, and mental health services. Our goal is to become that one-stop shop that anything or everything uh, individual family of immigrant or refugee may need as resource, they could come here and we'll be able to provide them that information to that resource. And if there is a resource that we don't have, uh, we'll go find it for them. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Ayan. Uh, I'm from South Sudan. Joseph has been a natural helper for nearly a year. He's been helping people connect to a COVID relief program that provides financial assistance. He is one of the Lost Boys of Sudan. In 1987, a civil war forced about 20,000 young boys to flee the Northeast African country and walk to Ethiopia and then Kenya to find refuge. Joseph came to the U.S. two decades ago and was resettled in Denver with about 40 other Lost Boys. One of the hardest parts of moving here, he says, was the cold, snowy weather. We are like homesick, you know, because we love home and we thought we will never see everybody again, you know, so it was like hard to, to adjust to a new place. Joseph has done quite well in Colorado. When he came to the Metro Denver area, his main goal was to get an education, which he did. He has a bachelor's degree and works in security. Joseph is married to a Sudanese woman and they live in Aurora with their five kids. When he was asked to become a natural helper last year, he said yes. It was an extension of the work he was already doing. I like to help people in my life. You know, I've been, yeah, working, help people in the community, let people come together, you know, and try to solve community issues. With the help of immigrants like Joseph and Bim, Beck has accomplished a lot over the past five years. In addition to being home to the Aurora Welcome Center, the nonprofit offers about a dozen programs serving nearly 40 communities. As the organization was growing their services, so was the city of Aurora. But there was more work to do. According to the city, many immigrants and refugees living in Aurora don't have the necessary skills to enter the workforce. And nearly one in five of these families are living in poverty. So when the initial three-year integration plan ended, Local leaders felt they needed to create a new, more expansive plan. But this time, they looked to these communities to lead the way. 
that was a big lesson, and, and we learned that. That's Ricardo Gambetta again, Aurora's manager of international and immigrant affairs. And that, that is why on the second time, we did the opposite. We tried to work more directly with the community in terms of proposals. Almost everything came from the community. So I, I think that made the difference because the community feel ownership on, on the plan. In 2020, the city unveiled a new 10-year immigrant integration plan. It's still the only city in Colorado and one of a handful across the country to have an initiative like this. It's called Aurora is Open to the World, and the goal is to build on our city's success of developing opportunities for immigrants and refugees and to expand our international presence. One in every five It's important to remember that local leaders have the bottom line in mind. They are trying to create economic success for immigrants, but also for the city. For Aurora Mayor Mike Kaufman, that includes fostering international trade. And a lot of that is with uh, the respective countries that these uh, immigrant communities come from that, you know, want to invest some of the money that they've earned here and want to encourage investment by um, uh, businesses uh, in our city. Mayor Kaufman says he's not looking to create a melting pot where immigrants lose their own identities. And that's part of the richest, rich, richness of the fabric of our city is uh, our diverse cultures. Salwa and I are talking in a private room at a Denver Public Library branch when her eight-year-old son comes in with an urgent matter. You need help again? Yes. Why? He can't get into his video game. I keep on forgetting my password. So now it's your password? Yes. So you sent an email to me? Yes. Oh, boy. Salwa is married now with four kids. She's come a long way since she moved to Aurora in 1999 to pursue her dreams. This library is about 10 miles from where she lived back then. The city's natural helpers program did not exist, but she had an old-fashioned support system. Her uncle Urias Potter and his family. I appreciate everything that they did for me, absolutely. In retrospect, they did something most people won't do, we just take a relative in. And then given the fact that they were just starting out their own lives with their children, it was a sacrifice. After Salwa landed a job, Urias took her to the Community College of Aurora to register for her very first classes. And luckily for me, she took the placement exam and she didn't have to do any prerequisites or anything. She just passed straight the English and math. She took a couple pre-med classes, including biology and chemistry, but the cost of education was expensive. Sometimes I would sit out a semester because I haven't finished paying for the last one. So I, I went through that for many, many, many years. It took her nine years to get her associate degree. But like so many newcomers, education was the key to her future. On the next episode of the Colorado Dream, Newcomers Welcome, we meet the first African woman elected to the Aurora Public School Board of Education. We needed a seat um, in that space for people to understand where we come from and why we are here. That's next time on episode three, Education. The Colorado Dream, Newcomers Welcome, is a production from KUNC. It was written and reported by me, Stephanie Daniel. Editing by Johanna Zorn. Fact-checking by Kat Jaffe, with additional help from Adam Reyes. This season's theme song was composed by Jason Patton, who also sound designed and mixed the episode. Additional audio is from Aurora TV and Aurora Now. Ashley Jeffcoat is the digital editor. Special thanks to Chandra Thomas Whitfield, Robert Leja, Kyle Cunningham, and Kim Race. Sean Corcoran is KUNC's Executive News Director. Tammy Turwell is KUNC's President and CEO. 
To learn more about Salwa Mortada Bamba and the city of Aurora, and to see photos of the people included in this episode and other extras, go to KUNC.org slash Colorado Dream, or check out the show notes for a link. 